Hello everyone, uh, and in this video we're going to be looking at capacity um, from a fairly basic sense to build up our understanding um, of the concept of capacity. So we're really going to be doing three separate things. Uh, we're going to be uh, defining capacity, which is obviously uh, the first thing. Um, once we've defined capacity, we want to understand how we can measure capacity. Uh, and then lastly, what the purposes of managing capacity are, what the objectives of manage, uh, managing capacity are. So if we tackle the first question, what is capacity? Um, it is something which is really at the core of operations. Um, operations management is defined as uh, the management of um, the production and delivery of products and services uh, and capacity is really the scale of which you can do that the scale of which you can uh, produce and deliver goods and services uh, so whatever the object of your operation is uh, so the operation of the university for example at least on the teaching side uh, would be the um, teaching of students and the awarding of degrees. Uh, so the capacity of the university is really the scale of which they can teach students and award degrees. Um, if your operations object is to produce shoes, then capacity is the scale of which you can actually produce shoes. Uh, so it really is fundamentally about scale, uh, but scale can be tricky um, because scale, unless we have some kind of time dimension to scale, we don't always get an accurate sense of uh, the processing capability of the operation itself. Uh, so if I say to you that my factory is capable of producing 5,000 shoes, um, the natural question would be, is that 5,000 shoes uh, in a single day, in a single hour, in a single week? Um, so really an easy way of uh, understanding the two dimensions of um, capacity would be the scale with a time, uh, the scale of an operation with a time frame. Um, so any given operation will be able to produce these two dimensions. So 24,000 products per day if you're a uh, manufacturing firm, uh, if you're a call center and your operation is built around calling um, customers or calling individuals then the volume of calls with the time frame uh, or if you're a service organization how many people can you serve uh, within a given time frame or session as well so any type of scale with a particular time frame now that sounds nice and simple and it is um, however it can be sometimes tricky to actually understand what scale is the best uh, measurement of capacity within an operation. Uh, so if you're producing shoes, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, and that's clearly the key thing that we need to measure is the amount of shoes you can produce. Uh, but for many operations, um, we also need to consider input as well as output. Um, so we have an output measure of capacity. Uh, and that may be really important, but it's not always a direct line between uh, the input into the operation and the thing that's being outputted. Uh, there may be various different factors involved. Uh, that means that it's not just an one equals one scenario. Um, so if you're manufacturing something and you're manufacturing a different range of goods, uh, then your input measurement of capacity so in this case, the scale of what you can achieve with your inputs, uh, so in this case, machine hours um, may not always match up to your output measure of capacity. So the TV units produced per week, simply because if you're producing 65 inch TVs, uh, that may require 30 machine hours per unit. Whereas if you're switching over and you're producing a greater number of, um, of say, you know, 28 inch TVs, uh, that may only require 10 or 15 machine hours. Uh, so when you have that kind of variability, uh, then you want to distinguish between your input measurement of capacity and your output measurement of capacity. Uh, another reason why you may want to distinguish between your input and your output measurements of capacity may be because of a significant time lag or, or a significant delay between um, uh, people, materials or goods going into your operation 
and your operation actually uh, outputting uh, 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 you know the thing that you're measuring uh, so good example of this would be university so any given year you might have an input measurement of capacity of the number of students who are actually registered or enrolled um, however the output measurement of capacity may fluctuate in a completely different pattern um, because the majority of students are enrolled on a three-year undergraduate course for example um, so you would want to distinguish between your total number of students in any given year uh, compared to your output measurement of capacity. We also have the additional complication there that your input measurement is not going to be the same as your output measurement even if you account for a three-year delay and you isolate a given cohort or a course simply because you also have an attrition rate as well. If you have 50 students uh, going into a university operation you're not necessarily going to have 50 students graduating when that program is finished. Uh, so we want to distinguish between the two measurements of capacity there also. Uh, the last example I, I just want to pick on here would be on hospitals. Uh, so here our output measurement of capacity would be patients treated per week. Um, so we want to understand how many patients we were able to process and successfully treat and that would be an important measurement for any operation to understand how efficiently or effectively that operation is running. Uh, however, our input measurement of capacity, in this case the number of beds that are actually available, um, won't directly translate to the number of patients treated per week. Uh, so if you were concerned that you were uh, under capacity, so your demand was greater than capacity, uh, simply increasing your input measurement, the number of beds available, doesn't necessarily translate to a greater number of patients treated per week, the output measurement of capacity. Um, this may be for a number of reasons. It could be that your treatment processes aren't efficient. They could be that there's a bottleneck somewhere else in the process, somewhere else in the operation. Uh, the number of doctors, for example, or the, uh, the actual process of treatment uh, may not be as efficient as it needs to be. Um, so that's another reason why we want to really distinguish and understand the different measurements of capacity as it relates to the different areas of the operation. Uh, our next note on capacity is going to be aggregate capacity uh, and this is where there's a number of different configurations or a number of uh, different complexities when it comes to measuring the uh, specific capacity of any given operation. Uh, so hotels are a good example. Uh, so if you look at a hotel that has five rooms that doesn't mean that you can assume that there's going to be five guests in total if you're at full capacity. Uh, the number of guests in each room may vary and that will come with obvious um, impacts on, on other part of the uh, operation as well. Number of towels used, uh, the amount of soap and uh, shampoo and so on used, um, as well as revenue, obviously. Uh, however, when we talk about the capacity of a hotel, uh, we are talking about aggregate capacity. So for simplicity's sake and to have a uh, an easier way of understanding and, and measuring the capacity of a hotel against another hotel, uh, we'll just measure the rooms per night. Uh, in a similar way, when it comes to an aluminium producer, the second example here, uh, there may be many different variations of aluminium that we're producing. There may be different configurations uh, that we can set our production line up on uh, to produce different levels of each type of uh, aluminium. Uh, but ultimately, if we're looking for the aggregate capacity, we're measuring the amount we can output of all different variations of aluminium or all different types of aluminium. So when you see the term aggregate capacity, uh, that's simplifying some of the uncertainties, complexities or variations involved uh, and gives you a single figure, which is useful to measure against other operations uh, or even quite useful to understand your operation in different time periods or in different configurations. Uh, so that's our understanding of capacity uh, in terms of um, the definition and different ways of measuring input, output and aggregate capacity. Uh, lastly, we, we do want to have a, a look at the ultimate objectives of capacity uh, management. So the reason why we 
measure capacity and we want to manage capacity within our operation uh, is to make sure that we have the right amount of capacity at any given time. Uh, excess capacity is generally a bad thing. Uh, it means that you have more resources than you're using. Uh, so if you have a cinema that has too many seats, uh, those seats are generally not being used um, because you never really have that many customers, uh, then you have excess capacity and those seats cost money. Uh, they cost money, they're not free, they would have had an initial investment in the seat itself, the materials and so on. Uh, they also cost space, that space could be used for something else which is generating revenue. Um, so you never have extra capacity which is not costing you anything. Um, there's also the, the, the well, essentially this is the concept of uh, opportunity cost. So even if it's not costing you money directly because it's already a sunk cost, you've already spent money on it and you're not having to pay for constant upkeep or maintenance, um, you're still using those resources uh, in a way that doesn't generate revenue and you could generate revenue by using those resources in a different way. That's the opportunity cost of any given action. Um, similar to, to this, you guys are watching this video. So you're, you're spending your time watching this video uh, and you've had an opportunity cost here. You could have used uh, this 10 or 15 minutes to go and, and have a jog in a park, to go and drink something or have a cigarette or I don't know. Um, I would usually say something about you could use this time to go and watch Liverpool be the best team in the world, but this is a very weird time for football. Um, but all of those things are opportunity costs. They're things that you can't do with those resources. Um, so it, it really is important for an operation to try and uh, render the appropriate or the ideal amount of capacity at any given moment. Uh, otherwise, it's either real costs or there's opportunity costs that are being incurred. Uh, in terms of how we want to try and measure or understand the appropriate amount of capacity, uh, well, we would have a, a few general principles that we want to understand. Uh, so obviously, the amount of costs that a business can absorb will be one key one. So you want to minimize your costs as much as possible. You also want to maximize revenue. So you'd want to balance having minimal capacity against the potential to use that capacity in different ways to maximize your revenue. Uh, that's a, a, stand and a standard tension within any business. Um, but also the amount of working capital you have on hand would be quite important, uh, especially if it's capacity that costs money to continually uh, keep up. Uh, a good example of this is usually labor costs. Uh, so if you have more labor, you generally increase your capacity. So if you think about a hairdressers, uh, the more uh, barbers or hairdressers the operation has on hand at any given moment, um, then you boost your available capacity. Um, but that's a immediate cost that's being incurred. Uh, so the amount of working capital you have really does determine the amount of potential capacity you could develop. Uh, and that has to then be balanced against potential service levels. Uh, so excess capacity in situations like a barber's or a hairdresser's also leads to improved service. It means that someone could walk in off the street uh, and book an appointment for the same day fairly easily. Uh, it could mean um, someone could have a haircut that has a, uh, a longer duration, um, that has more care and attention paid to it, and therefore leads to a better service being provided. Uh, which if there was tight capacity and a fewer number of barbers or hairdressers, um, that may not be possible. So again, you're balancing here working capital against service levels. Um, so there is no standard calculation you can make to, uh, to identify the exact appropriate amount of capacity at any point. It's always going to be a system of payoffs and, and, and losses. You, you need to understand uh, what kind of appropriate level would be appropriate for your business under your strategic plan and so on. Um, but we still have those general guidelines uh, uh, when it comes to trying to develop an appropriate level. Uh, and that is a major challenge because we 
really have a situation where capacity is automatically handled. Um, the usual challenge is that demand fluctuates, uh, whereas capacity doesn't automatically have the ability to follow those fluctuations. Uh, so a, a, a typical problem is, is that your operation has flat capacity, i.e. it has, uh, as the red line shows here, uh, you have a standard level of capacity um, at all points during the operation. But your demand isn't flat. Your demand itself is uh, is is variable. Uh, so we have a three step plan when it comes to capacity management. Uh, you measure your capacity. So whether it's your aggregate capacity, your input or your output capacity, you identify which measurement of capacity is is most important or most appropriate to manage carefully. You identify alternative capacity plans in order to try and reconcile demand with capacity. So where you develop the most appropriate uh, uh, level of capacity for your forecasted demand, choose the one which is uh, uh, the best at reconciling demand and capacity, implement it, and you have your, your, your essential capacity management activities for your operation.